meekness. Uh, the reason why we give God praise and thanks. Number one, things could always be worse. Always remember that. Things could always be worse. When you drive down the street or walk down the street, there's somebody that's sleeping on the ground. Things that could always be worse. There are people right now who are in jail. Things could always be worse. There are people right now who are in the hospital. Things could always be worse. So we give God, we say, you know what, God? Thank you. Thank you. Regardless of what's going on in your life and what you've got to be, when, you know, something you mad at. But remember, it could always be worse. It could always be worse. First, turn to Matthew chapter 7. Tonight we're going to talk about biblical wisdom. Wisdom. And we all need wisdom. Amen. Turn to Matthew chapter 7. We're going to read verse 1. And you got to say amen. Matthew chapter 7. We're going to read verse 1. And you got to say amen. You think God say hold up. Matthew chapter 7. It says, Judge not that ye be not judged. All right, put a pen in that. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged also. And with what, what measure ye meet, it shall also be measured unto you again. And then it says, And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thy own eye? Judge not that ye be not judged. What is judging? Judging is making a decision about somebody without all the information. And we all do it. Each one of us is guilty of judgment. We'll see something happen to somebody, and we'll be like, mm, that's what she did. I remember, that's called judgment. Or we'll make a condemnation on somebody. That's called judgment. We're all guilty of judgment. And what the Bible says is, don't judge, because whatever way you judge somebody, that's the same way somebody's going to judge you. And see, the thing is this. It's always funny until they laughing at you. It's always nice until the gossip is about you. So the thing is, if you don't judge others, then you won't be judged. Now, here, here's the beautiful part of this. Here's the beautiful part of this. People will try to clown you for the things that you're struggling with. Oh, think about that. People will try to clown you for the things that you're struggling with. So rather than judging someone, Work hard to improve your flaws. Rather than standing in judgment, work on you. Each one of us has flaws. I know I got all this up. So the thing is, rather than talking about somebody else, be in the mirror looking like, you know, how can Michael get better? How can I do this better? How can I improve this? Because we all have things that we need to work on. So rather than judging others, let's work on improving self. Improving your own issues. We all have things that we struggle with. And some things we can't fix. So rather than judging, let's try to improve our own self. Let's become a better us. And guess what? You can do it. Uh, here's the thing. Uh, some of y'all are pointing. And we got some youngsters back there, 14. Guess what? Uh, you can be a better you next year. You can be a better you in five years. You can be a better you in 20 years. And it all is related to you trying to improve you. So work on improving yourself. Work on improving yourself. All right, next, turn with me to Matthew 8 and 16. Matthew 8 and 16. Matthew 8 and 16. That's easy, that's the next page. Matthew 8 and 16. And it says, when the evening was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils. And he cast out the spirits with his word. And he healed all that were sick. It said, when, the evening, when night had come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils. And he cast out the spirits with his word. And he healed all that were sick. Uh, how many of you have ever been really mad before? Really mad. Raise your hand. You've been really mad. Everybody should raise their hand here. How many of you ever been so mad you blacked out? All right, so you've been so mad, you blacked out, you don't know what happened. All you knew was, when you came back, it was a whole lot of damage done. You're like, oh my God, I did this. The thing is, sometimes when you get so angry, that's not you. That's called the spirit. Uh, the problem with a lot of us is we don't understand spirits. We think 
that we're just in this body. You know, this little body. You know, I'm 175 pounds. Well, I don't get some COVID. Hey, I'm 178 pounds. Hey, Amen. I got a little COVID on me. Uh, but we think we're just this body. But this body is just a piece of dirt that has blood and water and nerves and bones. That's all it is. However, this body is controlled by spirits. See, some are good spirits that tell you to do good things. And some are bad spirits that tell you to do bad things. In fact, we're going to go to a next, uh, turn with me next to uh, Ephesians 4 and 23. Ephesians 4 and 23. And as you're turning to that, uh, let me explain this to you. So the thing is, each of our actions is controlled by a spirit. We have spirits inside of us. And in this other passage, Matthew 8 and 16, Jesus saw people who had crazy spirits. They had evil spirits. They had babbling spirits. Um, when you walk by and see the homeless, that's the spirit. When you see the lady that, or the man that's stuck on alcohol or stuck on drugs, that's the spirit. When you see the person that has uh, addiction, sexual addiction, that's the spirit. There are all spirits that can go in and out of us. Uh, I fuss at a lot of y'all because y'all get tattooed. Y'all love the tattoo ministry. Ministry. That's the spirit. These are all spirits. And the thing is, we have to try to get control over these spirits and repel or cast out or command out the spirits that are no good for us. Uh, let's look at Ephesians 4 and 23. Ephesians 4 and 23. Ephesians 4, 4 and 23 says this. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So simple. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. When I first heard that, I was like, okay, be renewed. Uh, think differently. I said, okay, that's cool. That's cool. So think differently. We're going to talk about that in a second. Think differently. But here's the powerful part of this. And I didn't realize it. The bishop pointed it out. Your thoughts are spirit. Your thoughts are spirit. What do you mean by that? Whenever you think something, it demands an action on your body. Remember, everything that you do starts with a thought. You coming here tonight start with a thought. Some of y'all have jobs now that start with a thought. Some of y'all right away from college that start with a thought. Everything that you do starts with a thought. And what the Bible says, it says here in Ephesians 4 and 23, it says, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. You know what's interesting about thought? Uh, if you had a CAT scan machine, uh, Bishop had to get a surgery. He had to get an MRI. He had to get in this big machine. And, and, go, and, and then it prints out a picture that comes on the CD. Long story short, whenever you think, your brain lights up. If you had an MRI machine and they put you inside of that and, and somebody plays your favorite song, a certain part of your brain lights up because thoughts are energy. It's spirit. The word spirit, all it means is electricity. Uh, when you die, uh, my wife is a respiratory therapist, and when people come in there, she said they call it cold blue, cold blue, and they get this machine, they rub together, they go cold, they go clear, boom, and they shoot electricity into them. Because the spirit is gone. You are controlled by spirit. Even our very, very physical body is controlled and run by spirit. So the Bible teaches us, and we're going to look at it in Romans 12 and 2. Turn to Romans 12 and 2. Romans 12 and 2. Romans 12 and 2. Romans 12 and 2. And, and I have dropped the script now, so we, we all know the spirit now. Romans 12 and 2. Romans 12. This is one of my favorite older bishops' uh, favorite passages. Romans 12 and 2, it says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What does that mean? you got to change your mind about certain things. If you change your mind and change how you think, you change your life. You'd be surprised how just changing one thing in your life can change your whole outlook, the whole way you think. And a lot of us, the problem with us is not what's around us. It's our thinking. We have bad thoughts. And if you have bad thoughts, 
There's a negative spirit that's influencing those bad thoughts, and then it's causing you to do bad things. So the Bible says, renew your mind, renew your thinking, renew your spirit. Because if you have a renewed spirit, now you're heading in a different direction. Guess what? You're going to make mistakes. I would never stand up here and say, be perfect, be holy, walk on water, don't do any sin, you are amazing. I'm not going to stand here and waste time. Because the thing is, you're, you're in this body. David says, I was born in sin. And I was transgressed in iniquity. What does that mean? You was born with sins attached to your skin already. We call those generation curses. The thing is, if you want to break a curse, think differently. That is so powerful. If you can learn, if you understood how powerful you are, your body is controlled by the thoughts. And the problem with a lot of us is it's not what's going on, it's your thinking. Uh, uh, one of my favorite mentors, his name was Johnny Cochran. He ended up becoming O.J. Simpson's lawyer. Long story short, he was raised in South Central. He had another friend that become, became president with President Clinton. He was raised in the projects, the same one that Peter used to live in. But he ended up becoming a big-time lawyer because while he was in the community, he thought different. Your key is your thinking. If you can ever grab hold of that. If you think different, things change around If you think different, the situation evolves. So learn how to control your thinking. Sometimes it ain't about the money that's in your pocket. Uh, what's funny, I have a, uh, a, a guy, his name is Larry Elder. He's a, a TV talk show host. Long story short, he says, if you work at McDonald's and you don't have children, you have enough money to support yourself. The reason why a lot of us end up in financial debt, including me, I'm looking in the mirror, is because we think differently. We think that a credit card means that we have more money. We think because we got a 700 FICO score, that means that we can go buy a $100,000 car. And the thing is, like, you only make $42,000 a year. Why do you drive a $100,000 car? So the thing is, a lot of times we put ourselves in situations behind our things. And I'm talking to myself. So the point is, we need to think differently. Think different. Think different. Because thought is related to spirit. Spirit. Uh, turn to John 4 24. John, I love this one. John 4 24. John, look at John. Look at John. 4 and 24. John 4 and 24. Um, I've heard this scripture since I was a little baby. It says, God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Okay, I heard that. I said, that's tight. So God is spirit. We also have spirit inside of us. And guess who else is spirit? Satan is spirit. You have all these spirits. But here's the thing what God says. He says, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit, with your spirit, your spirit, your energy. That's why it's hard to be a Christian and not come to church. I have some friends watching right now. I invited a lady here tonight. And she said, COVID, I can't come out there. Uh, what, what's that saying about your spirit? If I was giving away $10,000, I better put me right up in here and sit down waiting for $10,000. The thing is, we do what we'd rather be doing. We often do what we'd rather be doing. We only we do what's important to us. And that has to do with our thought. But here's what God says. He says, those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. What is truth? Be you. Be you. Uh, when I was growing up, I grew up in a church where I couldn't be a Christian. And I couldn't be a Christian because of my sin. Because the church I grew up in, nobody sinned. They all spoke in tongues. They all were water baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost and they, and they all did these things and the ladies wore long dresses and nobody cursed and, and nobody danced and nobody did nothing. So I was like, wait, I guess I'm going to hell. I can't do none of that. But when I read this Bible, I got saved because God said, worship him in truth. What is truth? You. Jesus says, come as you are. He didn't say, come to me perfect. He says, come to me with you. Because God knows you. He knows you better than you know you. Uh, I, I have a friend, and he, and he was really shocked when I got turned to, to a pastor. And he was like, but I know you. I was like, yeah, I know. But I know you. I, like, I know. God knows you. 
And guess what? He's calling some of you to great destinies. And many, and a smart man told me this once. He said, the greater the gift, the greater the sin. If you're a great man, you got great sins. Because there has to be balance. You can't be, uh, if y'all love President Barack Obama, and, and, to, and to black people, he's black Jesus. He just floats on water, he can do no wrong. The only reason y'all love President Barack Obama so much is because you don't know him. You only know what they show you about him. But if you really got to know that brother, you might not love him as much as you think. Because the greater the man, the greater the sin. It has to be balanced inside of this body. Everything in our environment has to be balanced. There's the sun, there's the moon. There's day, there's night. Everything has to be balanced. But here's what God says. Worship me with you, with your truth. And the longer we worship him, he'll start to change you. See, you can't change you. You can think differently, but you can't change you. But what you say is, God, take me as I am, and he'll start working, and working the creeps off of you, and working the dirt off of you, and he'll dust you up, and he'll put you in the fire, and he'll burn you, and you'll be turned into the perfect diamond that he created you to be. But what it is, is called a process. Process. You know what a process means? It takes time. Success takes time. Patience is some kind of hard thing to do. You have to wait to be perfected. It's not going to be instant. If I gave each of you a million dollars right now, most of you would lose it within 30 days. You would go buy, some of y'all buy some big old chain, some of y'all would go buy a big old car, some of y'all go buy a big house, and next thing you know, six months later, you broke. Because in order to have that kind of responsibility, you have to be prepared. God is preparing you for the blessings that he has for you. And if you believe him, he says, your latter days shall be greater than your former days. If you walk with him, he'll make your end of your life better than it was before. I am living proof of that. I remember one year we were laying on the beach in the Bahamas. And I start crying. I'm not going to cry now. I'm holding it in. But I start crying because I remember when I was homeless. And I'm like, I went from homeless to a beach in the Bahamas and got in the water, we saw the fishes swimming. I said, nothing but the grace of God. But if you walk with him, he can transform your life. He can add unto you everything that you need to prosper. Because God says, I came that you might have life and have it more abundant. God did not come so you can struggle. Often, many times that we struggle is because of our flaws, our iniquities. The things that our family curses that we have to break. Some of y'all are shaking off drug addiction. Some of y'all are shaking off four or five baby mamas. Some of y'all are shaking off prison. Some of y'all are shaking off uh, sexual abuse and, and all kind of craziness. Shake it off and move forward because God has called you to a perfect awareness. Last, next to the last thing, turn to Hebrews. Turn to Hebrews. This is good. Thank you, Jesus. Hebrews 6 and 1. Hebrews 6 and 1. Hebrews 6 and 1. Hebrews 6 and 1. It says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from the dead works and of faith toward God. Alright, that's a lot of big word. Right. Let me read the translation. It says, Let us not stop going over the same old ground again and again. Always teaching those first lessons about Christ. Let us go on instead to other things and become more mature in understanding as strong Christians ought to be. Surely we don't need to speak further about foolish things. All right, turn with me next to Hebrews 12 and 1. We'll put that together. Hebrews 12 and 1. Just switch on over. Six chapters over. Hebrews 12 and 1. Hebrews 12 and 1. It says, Wherefore seeing also... Compass about with such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that God has set before us. All right, all right, we'll put that together. Some of you, because of your thought pattern, and let me get this right, you can be going everywhere and nowhere at the same time. 
Let me say that again. Some of you, because of the way you think, you can, you can be going everywhere and nowhere at the same time. Uh, my wife works out, and she, we have a treadmill in our house. And the treadmill, she runs three to five miles on the treadmill. But she's running, and she ain't going nowhere. And that's what some of us are doing in our life. We're thinking about everything. We make it all kind of decisions. We make it all kind of discussion, and we ain't going nowhere. And three years past, we made no progress. That's what a lot of us do. And the reason why we ain't going forward is because we're too busy looking back. Some of y'all got some stuff you ain't never let go of. Some of y'all got some pain that's still in your heart. And because you still got those things in your heart, even though you're running, you're running, you ain't going nowhere. You running, you running, and you still stuck. God says, move forward. You got to let go of certain things. Some of y'all can't forgive. <laughs> he raped me, can't forgive. He abandoned me, can't forgive. She stole my man, can't forget. He, he did this. She did that. And we're holding on to these sins. And the thing is, you keep holding on, and because you holding on, you can't go forward. Nowhere, I know people that have been stuck in the same place for 40 years. I promise you. I'm 50 years old. I know people be stuck in the same place for 40 years. Ain't made no progress in 40 years. Because they still stuck. Because something happened to them when they were five. And they never can get over it. And they never forget. Matter of fact, let's turn real quick, real quick, real quick. Uh, turn to the book of Micah. 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 And then somebody gets Psalm 103 12. The book of Micah. Let me see how God is. What chapter? The book of Micah. Micah chapter 7. Go to verse 18. Micah chapter 7. Go to verse 18. M-I-C-A-H. Micah chapter 7. Go to verse 18. And it says, Who is a God like unto thee, that pardoneth iniquity, and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage, he retaineth not his anger forever, because he delighted in mercy. Alright, we'll translate that. He will again, he will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities, and thou wilt cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. Thou wilt perform the truth of Jacob and the mercy of Abraham, which thou hast sworn unto the fathers from the days of old. Now let me translate that. It says, God, when we sin, we sin against two people. We sin against ourselves, and we sin against God. But because God loves us so much, when we sin, and we say, God, Please forgive me for going on more and other attending the pictures to that girl. And, and God said, oh, okay. You ask for forgiveness. You repent. Hear what God do. He take it and he throws it to the sea of forgiveness. He takes our sin and he throws it away into the sea of forgetfulness. And it goes into this big old ocean and it goes down into the sea of forgetfulness. All right, let's go to Psalms 103 and 12. We're going to put all this together. We're almost done. God is good. Psalm 103, 12. Psalm 103, 12. And as far as the east is from the west, so far have he removed our transgressions from us. So far as the east is from the west, so far have he removed our transgressions from us. So we read first, God cast our sins into the sea of forgetfulness. And then he says he's going to separate them as far as the east is from the west. Here's why. When you ask God to forgive you, he forgives. Then he forgets. Now, God knows everything. He knows what's going to happen for the next billion years. He knows what happened four billion years ago. He knows every detail. He knows the, the number of hairs in our head. But he takes our sin and he forgets them. Why would God do that? Anybody, why would God do that? Anybody, why would God forget? Go ahead. Right. God takes our sins and throws them away because if he keeps remembering them, he won't forgive us. And what a lot of us do is we hold on to the sin. Even when somebody says, I'm sorry. Okay. You say okay with your mouth, but in your heart you still hold it. Matter of fact, uh, a, a smart man told me this. He said this. Learn to forgive 
and to forget fast. Learn to forgive and to forget things fast. Then he also says this. He says, stop remembering a past you cannot change. Stop remembering a past you cannot change. Uh, if something happened to you five minutes ago, ain't nothing you can do about it if, if, if right now. If something happened to you five years ago, five months ago, you don't have a time machine, you can't go back and fix it. But what a lot of us do is we hold people in conjecture. We hold people guilty. And by holding them guilty, we hold ourselves back. Because we can't go forth. I, I have a friend, I can't say the person's name, because she sometimes what? I have a friend who was mad at me for years. Years was mad at me. Ended up getting cancer. Mad at me. Because she was mad at me. See, the thing is, when you mad at somebody, sometimes they done forgot all about you. They go about their business. And you still mad. But you mad, the only person you hurting is you. The only person you hurt is you. Well, I can't forgive them. They hurt me. If they hurt you, release it so you can go forward. Release it. You've got to try to let this thing go. And I told you about my father. Father's Day coming up. I'll do that crying speech on Father's Day. But I had to forgive a father who abandoned me in six months. you got to let it go. Because if you don't, it will follow you unto the grave. It will follow you to the grave. Uh, and the last thing, last thing, last thing. Uh, turn to Matthew 6 and 13. Matthew 6 and 13. Matthew 6 and 13. And this is beautiful. This, this is beautiful. Matthew 6 and 13. When I first read this, uh, Bishop Kenneth Oliver read it. And uh, he explained to me the, the depth of it. Matthew 6 and 13. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine the king and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, good. Verse 14. For if ye forgive men of their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Verse 15. But if ye forgive not men of their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. The thing is, if you hold on to anger, and you keep it in your soul, you might end up going to hell. What? Hold on, time out, time out. I believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, he rose from the dead, he's alive. Yeah, but you got anger in your heart. But I believe Jesus walked on water and he healed all them people. But you still mad at your father. I, 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 I'm saying sanctified. I've been with the Holy Ghost, water baptized. But you still mad at somebody. God don't want you in heaven mad. Why would God want you in heaven carrying the same stuff from earth to heaven? Why would he want that in his heaven? See, sometimes we don't realize that, that God is, we are made in God's image. Uh, Satan used to be where? Heaven. And Satan had an issue in his heart in heaven. And Satan turned out one third of the angels because he was mad at God. You think God wants to start this story all over again and start this mess all over again because you mad at somebody and you can't forgive? So if you don't forgive, you stand in eternal possible damnation for holding a grudge because God don't want that mess no more. Remember, he knows your heart. What's going to get you into heaven? It won't be your actions. We fail at that. If you can't say I'm good, lies. Even the Bible says your, your, your goodness is in filthy rags. You can never stand before God and say, I am holy, I am pure, I am good, God, God, I'm God. And God be like, he's a liar from the pit of hell. I know you. I saw what you did when nobody was there. You forget, God sees everything that we do, even your secret sins. So we can't stand before him and say, God, let me into heaven because I'm so holy. We have to stand before him in mercy. So we have to stand before him in mercy because he forgives us. And if he forgives us, we have to forgive others. And even if they don't apologize, let me say that again. You have to forgive some people because some people too stupid to apologize. You have to forgive some people because some people got too much pride to apologize. And if you keep, see the thing, the reason why you're forgiving them is for you. It ain't about them. It's about you. 
Because you want to go forward, you want to prosper, you want to grow, you want to be in good health, you want to be where God wants you to be. But you have to let it go. And the very last thing, we're going to do this for Black Lives Matter. Uh, turn to Luke 3 and 14. Bitch, you me, I give myself away. Luke 3 and 14. This is for our Black Lives Matter brethren and sisters. Uh, we got a bigger following now on social media. Amen. We've got to speak to them. Black Lives Matter. The Bible says, Luke 3, 14. The Bible says, everything that's wrong in the world is because of the church and the pastors. So I'm going to do my Black Lives Matter thing tonight. Luke 3, 14. Luke 3, 14. And it says this. And the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, they're talking about Jesus. And what shall we do? And Jesus said unto them, do no violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. I read this probably about six years ago. That passage was dedicated to police officers. The problem with the Bible is, no, sorry, the problem with church is that a lot of pastors don't tell you what's in the Bible. What they do is we do tradition. And what tradition is, we, uh, on Easter we're going to preach Jesus was on the cross. And, and then on Christmas we're going to in the Mary story. We do a lot of tradition. They go over the same three passages, uh, sorry, the same 25 passages for years. This is right here in the Bible. Imagine, there are KKK members who think they're right. They're righteous. There are black people who are being hung right as we speak. They found another person last night in Houston. Some of these people are Christians. And they're going around killing these black people. And they think they're right. And some of them go to church. And they sit before a pastor. But see, the thing is, they don't read the whole book. The Bible clearly states right here, it says, police officers. It says, uh, do no violence to no man. Neither accuse any man falsely and be content with your wages. So the thing is, some of you are going to be pastors. I feel about two or three of y'all are going to go into the ministry. I know this one right here is. Okay. Oh, yeah, keep shaking your head. Like God going to chase you around your whole life. And you say, yes, Father, and you go on to get up here and start preaching. So at least three, two or three, y'all going to go or become pastors. And when you become a minister, use the whole Bible. Don't you use part of the Bible. Everything you go through is in here. It's a, it got, we got kids in tonight, so I can't tell you everything. There. But it's a lot. Everything that you struggle with is in here. Every addiction you have is in here. Everything that you've been through is in here. Uh, it's so interesting, and Bishop pointed this out to me. Paul wrote most of the New Testament while he was in jail. So for you brothers that been in jail, Paul was in jail. But while he was in jail, you know what he was doing? He was giving other people hope when he had no hope. That's, how, that's why I love this book. He wrote most of the New Testament while he was locked up. So the thing is, God gives you hope. He gives you peace. He gives you joy. Make a decision to continue to follow him. You ain't got to be perfect. Jesus loves you just the way you are. And, and that, that speaks to me. Because I know I got some things I struggle with. But God says, my grace is sufficient. So don't ever let anybody ever say, you ain't no Christian. You smoke weed, you tattoo, you do this, you do that. And just turn around and say, you said, my grace is sufficient. What does that mean? God loved me with the evidence. See, if God be for you, y'all know the rest of that. See, what was the rest of that? Who can be against you? You only need one fan. God. That's powerful. You don't need men to be your fan. See, some of y'all got the Instagram, y'all got 1,000, 12,000 followers and all this stuff. But see, guess what? All they can do is like <laughs> and not support and not be there for you and not meet your needs. Uh, see, the thing is, you know when somebody's your friend when you down and they lift you up. You know somebody's your friend when you need something and they're there to support you. It's funny, there are some people you call friends who wouldn't be there to help you when they'll come to your funeral. They, they wouldn't be there to help you, but they'll come to your funeral and say, oh, that was my friend, lies. And the last 
Kathy, I'll leave you with this. <laughs> a friend is somebody who never judges. See, a good friend never judges. They listen. Sometimes you need somebody to listen to. Now, they don't need to give you no answer. Just listen to you talk. And then to tell you, it's going to be okay. And guess who do that? Jesus Christ. Because he did it for me. I, I talk to God. Bishop, if you know how I talk to Jesus, you'll probably throw me out of this church. We'll be throwing out another church. If you talk to Jesus like that, me and God have a real deep conversation. Like, what up, cuz? We'll be talking like that. See, Jesus is from the hood. I'm from, you know, I'm from the hood. Jesus bang with me. And the thing is, I talk to God. We talk just like that. Because that's the relationship. Because that's who I am. God wants you to be his friend. Because you never want him to say, Depart from me. I know.